on superstitions by a g gardner it was inevitable that the fact that a murder has taken place at a house with the number 13 in a street the letters of whose name number 13 would not pass unnoticed if we took the last 100 murders that have been committed i suppose we should find that as many have taken place at number 6 or number 7 or any other number you choose as at number 13 that the law of averages is as inexorable here as elsewhere but this consideration does not prevent the world remarking on the fact when number 13 has its turn not that the world believes there is anything in the superstition it is quite sure it is a mere childish folly of course few of us would refuse to take a house because its number was 13 or decline an invitation to dinner because there were to be 13 at table but most of us would be just a shade happier if that desirable residence were numbered 11 and not any the less pleased with the dinner if one of the guests contracted a chill that kept him away we would not confess this little weakness to each other we might even refuse to admit it to ourselves but it is there that it exists is evident from many irrefutable signs there are numerous streets in london and at des in other towns too in which there is no house number 13 and i am told that it is very rare that a bed in a hospital bears that number the superstition thread bear though it has borne is still sufficiently real to enter into the calculations of a discreet landlord in regard to the letting qualities of his house and into the calculations of a hospital as to the curative properties of a bed in the latter case general agreement would support the concession to the superstition idle though that superstition is physical recovery is a matter of the mind as well as of the body and the slightest shadow on the mind may in a condition of low vitality retard and even defeat recovery florence nightingale's almost passionate advocacy of flowers in the sick bedroom was based on the necessity of the creation of a certain state of mind in the patient there are few more curious revelations in that moving record by m dumel of medical experiences during the war than the case of the man who died of a pimple on his nose he had been hideously mutilated in battle and was brought into hospital a sheer wreck but he was slowly patched up and seemed to have been saved when a pimple appeared on his nose it was nothing in itself but it was enough to produce a mental state that checked the flickering return of life it assumed a fantastic importance in the mind of the patient who having survived the heavy blows of fate died of something less than a pin prick it is not difficult to understand that so fragile a hold of life might yield to the sudden discovery that you were lying in number 13 bed i'm not sure that i could go into the witness box and swear that i am wholly immune to these idle superstitions myself It is true that of all the buses in London that number 13 chances to be the one that I constantly use and I do not remember until now ever to have associated the superstition with it and certainly I have never had anything but the most civil treatment from it it is as well behaved a bus and as free from unpleasant associations as any on the road I would not change its number if I had the power to do so. But there are other circumstances of which I should find it less easy to clear myself of suspicion under cross-examination. 
I never see a ladder against a house side without feeling that it is advisable to walk round it rather than under it. I say to myself that this is not homage to a foolish superstition, but a duty to my family. One must think of one's family. The fellow at the top of the ladder may drop anything. He may even drop himself. He may have had too much drink. He may be a victim of epileptic fits. And epileptic fits, as everyone knows, come on at the most unseasonable times and places. It is a mere measure of ordinary safety to walk round the ladder. No man is justified in inviting danger in order to flaunt his superiority to an idle fancy. Moreover, probably that fancy has its roots in the common sense fact that a man on a ladder does occasionally drop things. No doubt many of our superstitions have these commonplace and sensible origins. I imagine, for example, that the Jewish objection to pork as unclean on religious grounds is only due to the fact that in eastern climates it is unclean on physical grounds. All the same, I suspect that when I walk round the ladder, I'm rather glad that I have such respectable and unassailable reasons for doing so. Even if, conscious of the sus suspicion and ashamed to admit it to myself, I walk under the ladder, I am not quite sure that I have not done so as a kind of negative concession to the superstition. I have challenged it rather than been unconscious of it. There is only uh, one way of dodging the absurd dilemma and that is to walk through the ladder. It is not easy. In the same way, I am sensible of a certain satisfaction when I see the new moon in the open rather than through glass and over my right shoulder rather than my left. I would not for any consideration arrange these things consciously. But if they happen, so I fancy, I am better pleased than if they do not. And on these occasions, I have even caught my hand, which chanced to be in my pocket at the time, turning over money, a little surreptitiously, I thought, but still undeniably turning it. Hands have habits of their own, and one can't always be watching them. But these shadowy reminiscences of antique credulity, which we discover in ourselves, play no part in the lives of any of us. They belong to a creed outworn. Superstition was disinherited when science revealed the laws of the universe and put man in his place. It was no discredit to be superstitious when all the functions of nature were unexplored and man seemed the plaything of the beneficent or sinister forces that, that he could neither control nor understand, but which held him in the hollow of the hand. He related everything that happened in nature to his own inexplicable existence, saw his fate in the clouds, his happiness or misery announced in the flight of birds, and referred every phenomenon of life to the soothsayers and oracles. You may read in Thucydides of uh, battles being postponed and lost because some omen that had no more relation to the event than the falling of a leaf was against it. When Pompey was afraid that the Romans would elect Cato as Practa, he shouted to the assembly that he heard thunder and got the whole election postponed, for the Romans would never transact business after it had thundered. Alexander surrounded himself with fortune tellers and took counsel with them as a modern ruler takes counsel with his ministers. 
even so great a man as caesar and so modern and enlightened a man as cicero left their fate to augurs and omens sometimes the omens were right and sometimes they were wrong but whether right or wrong they were equally meaningless cicero lost his life by trusting to the wisdom of crows when he was in flight from antony and caesar augustus he put to sea and might have saved might have escaped but some crows chanced to circle round his vessel and he took the circumstances to be unfavorable to his action returned to shore and was murdered even the farmer of ancient greece consulted the omens and the oracles where the farmer today is only caref- careful of his manures i should have liked to have seen caesar and i should have liked to have heard cicero but on the balance i think we who inherit this later day and who can zest at the shadows that were so real to them have the better end of time it is pleasant to be about when the light is abroad we do not know much more of the power that turns the handles of this idol show than our forefathers did but at least we have escaped the grotesque shadows that envelop them we do not look for divine guidance in the entrails of animals or the flight of crows and the house of commons does not adjourn at a clap of thunder